Thank you so much. Nice to see you. I feel like I should run for office or something with a stage and a podium and a mic that's working. Hope you can, hope you can hear me okay. I can shout like Mussolini on a balcony. Um, it, it's so good to be a, a friend of John and Erica Amarati. I'm very grateful for that. I'm glad this group exists. I consider you something of a miracle. I guess Silicon Valley is not a conservative bastion. Um, <clears throat> I myself am from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I've always called it a small citadel of the left. I barely met a Republican until I was in my 20s. And I found that I, I liked them quite a lot. And I leaned toward them. So I'm grateful for those of you who are out and proud. And I guarantee you there are, I guarantee you there are closeted conservatives. And you may give them aid and comfort. And they might scurry up to you and say, I'm one too, and then scurry off before someone sees. <laughs> this used to happen to me quite a bit, and sometimes still does. So um, I'm glad you're here. And we know that we're not alone. We don't have to meet in a phone booth. It takes a big hall like this. <clears throat> so I've written this peculiar book, which I want to tell you about, uh, Children of Monsters an inquiry into the sons and daughters of dictators. Very strange topic, but I found it interesting. And I thought I'd begin by telling you the origin of it. I was in Albania some years ago, an unusual place to be. I've since been back, and Albania suffered one of the worst dictatorships of the whole 20th century, that of Enver Hoxha. It was almost a perfect totalitarian state. There was pretty much nothing else like it on earth except for the Kim regime in North Korea. And the dictator Hoxha and Kim Il-sung liked each other, imitated each other, and so on. And while I was in Albania, I thought, you know, did Hoxha have children? Because I couldn't imagine what it would be like. Uh, could you go out? How did people treat you? Did you have to change your name? Did you have to go abroad? What did you think of your dad? What's it like to bear a name synonymous with oppression and terror and torture and murder and all the rest of it. And I thought, because I'm a magazine writer, that a piece on the Hoja children, and there are three, might be kind of interesting. And then I thought, you know, you could do a survey of such sons and daughters and make a book of it called Children of Monsters. And I finally did it. And <clears throat> I cover 20 dictators and their offspring. And 20 is a nice, round, juicy number. So you might think that I aimed for it. But really, I drew up a list of dictators I wanted to cover. And it came to 20, kind of serendipitously. Uh, there were some I couldn't include because they didn't have children. Most prominently, Lenin. Also, Ho Chi Minh didn't have children. But I've got this murderer's row. And they're all 20th century. Uh, they leak into the 21st. Fidel Castro ruled into the 21st. Now we have the third Kim on the throne in North Korea and the second Assad in Syria. But we're talking pretty much about the 20th century. I could have gone back to antiquity. Uh, Caligula, Caligula had a child. He's such a monstrous guy, I can hardly say his name. Caligula had a child, just one little girl, and she was uh, murdered in, in a quite gruesome way the same day as her parents in, um, I think, 41 AD. I might be off by a year or two. I could have gone to 16th century Russia and Ivan the Terrible, who killed his son, the Tsarevich, with his scepter. Uh, he didn't mean to do it. He did it in a fit of rage and was immediately horrified by what he had done. And this moment is captured in a painting uh, of the 19th century by the famous Russian Repin. It's really a haunting thing. One of the dictators I cover, Bokassa of Central Africa, did kill people with his scepter. It was actually more of a walking stick made of ebony, very, very hard. He didn't kill any of his own children so far as I know, but he did imprison a couple of his sons for a while when they were unruly. So I've got my 20, and I thought I'd list the table of contents, my murderer's row, I begin with World War II dictators plus Franco. So you have Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, Stalin, Tojo. Then I stay in the Far East for Mao and the Kims. 
I go back to Europe, Eastern Europe or Soviet Europe for Hoxha in Albania and Ceausescu in Romania. Then to the Caribbean for the Duvaliers in Haiti, Papa Doc and Baby Doc. There's actually a third who advises the current president of Haiti and Fidel Castro. A little bit about Raul. I have three Arabs, Gaddafi, Assad, and Saddam over in Iran, Khomeini. Then four Africans, Mobutu of the country he renamed Zaire, Bokassa of, he renamed his country the Central African Empire, and he crowned himself, Napoleon style, the emperor. He was Bokassa the first. Uh, there wasn't a second, there was a designated second, but the first was deposed before the little guy had a chance to assume the throne. And then there's uh, everyone's favorite Idi Amin in Uganda, and Mengistu, the so-called Stalin of Ethiopia. And I end with a little coda, so to speak, on the late in life daughter of Pol Pot, the dictator of Cambodia. Uh, she's really a lovely young woman, about 30. She got married in, I think, March of 2014. Beautiful wedding. What a strange story. So, obviously there are commonalities in this book. I have themes of loyalty, disobedience, parenthood, childhood, nature, nurture, dictatorship, democracy, and all that. These children, my kids as I call them, sort of like Jerry's kids, uh, have some things in common. They share that common faith. They're the son or daughter of a dictator. At the same time, I don't do, do too much generalizing or psychologizing because they are individuals and they have lived their lives, coped with this common fate in their various individual ways. So my book is in part a series of life sketches, if you will. And I thought I'd touch on a few of the families, just to give you a taste, kind of a, a, a Whitman sampler. And uh, beginning with Hitler, and you might wonder what he's doing in the book, because Hitler, of course, had no children, we all know it. But there was a claimant who had a very unusual claim. He was a Frenchman, and his mother told him that he was the son of Hitler. The mother had been a peasant girl in France during World War I, and the story went that she met this German or Austrian soldier, Hitler. There was a liaison. This child came along, Jean-Marie Loret, and after the war, he fights in the French army, by the way, and after the war, World War II, the mother says to him, and he's now 30, by the way, that unknown German soldier father you've always wondered about? Hitler, the late chancellor of Germany, the most despised man in the world. That's a fine how do you do, right? And <clears throat> so this man's story is very interesting and a little bit macabre and sad. He looked a lot like Hitler, I must say. So does his son, Philippe, who lives in France, who has two portraits of Hitler on his living room wall. Uh, my line is that one would have been enough. But um, <clears throat> So most historians and biographers agree that Loret was not the son of Hitler. And I accept the consensus, though he did look a lot like him. The question for me is, he believed himself to be the son of Hitler, so what effect did this have on him? And the answer is, uh, not very good at all. He's a quite tormented person, as you might expect. A word about Mussolini, who had five children, five official children, I should say. There were lots of unofficial children. A lot of these guys have children, as I say, off the books. Uh, sometimes I call them extracurricular children, and Mussolini had many, many of those. But he had five official ones. The eldest was a daughter, Etta, whom he loved, and uh, who loved him back a great deal. By the way, I found that these guys, they loved their daughters especially, especially a firstborn daughter. Maybe that's true of men in general, but it was true of these characters, I would say. Etta grew up to marry Count Chano, young Count Chano, who became the foreign minister of his father-in-law. And there was this very ticklish time, to put it mildly, when he was slated for execution by Mussolini. So put yourself in Etta's shoes, if it's possible. There were two men she loved most in all the world, her father and her husband, in that order, I would say. And the one was executing the other, or at least declining to stay the execution of the other. And I try to sympathize with these kids, so to speak. It's very hard, I think, to put yourself in that position. And by the way, two of Saddam's daughters faced exactly the same thing. Their father, whom they loved, uh, killed their husbands. That is a very interesting and 
of course, ghoulish story. Uh, Mussolini's youngest child was a son, uh, Romano, who became a jazz pianist. And at the beginning of his career, played under a pseudonym. But he found that his last name, Mussolini, was more of a draw than a repellent. So his group became Romano Mussolini and the All-Stars. And they performed with Ella Fitzgerald and Dizzy Gillespie and pretty much all the other bigs you could name. And he was a quite good pianist. And he married the sister of Sophia Loren. Uh, they had a couple of daughters, including the infamous Alessandra Mussolini, who is today in the European Parliament. She is the leader of so-called neo-fascism in Italy. She's been in both chambers of the Italian Parliament. She's a real piece of work, mouthy. Earlier in her career, she was an actress. She was on the cover of Playboy, European edition. She has a medical degree. And can you imagine being an Italian and the granddaughter of Mussolini and the niece of Sophia Loren. It's um, quite something. Uh, jump to Stalin, if you will, who had three children officially, two boys and a girl. And the most famous child of, of any dictator, I would say, is Svetlana Stalin. Unless you count the successor sons, the, the sons who succeeded their father in office, so to speak. That would be two Kims, Assad, Baby Doc. Uh, Svetlana defected to the United States in 1967. It caused a sensation. She wrote three memoirs, at least two of which are very powerful. She lived a dramatic, all too dramatic life. I'll tell you just one story, because I so love the line. Uh, she defected when she was in India, and she walked into our embassy there and asked for political asylum. And our guy on duty said, so you say you're Stalin's daughter. The Stalin? I love that, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and, and she, she was indeed. Uh, let me say also that she had one American child, a girl named Olga, who changed her name to Chris. She now is the manager of a vintage uh, clothing and jewelry boutique in Portland, Oregon. Judging from the photos, she's a, a Pacific Northwest hipster with tattoos and maybe a nose ring and dyed hair. And uh, she looks rather like her grandfather. And, and, and imagine that, the granddaughter of Joseph Stalin working as an American in Portland, Oregon. Uh, history takes funny turns. And I'll give you another one with Tojo, who had seven children. The youngest was a daughter named Kimmy, who was 14 when her father was executed. She later came to the United States to study. Uh, she went to the University of Michigan in my hometown of Ann Arbor, as I think I've said. She moved into the same residence hall as my mother. My mother left the year before. And uh, Kimmy Tojo later married an American named Dennis Gilbertson, became an American citizen, lives in Honolulu, a stone's throw from Pearl Harbor. And if you can imagine, uh, this is the daughter, the child of the man who attacked Pearl Harbor thus launching the Pacific War, whose aim was to destroy the United States. Now this girl, this woman, I think she's an octogenarian, uh, lives in Honolulu as a US citizen. That really is something. Um, the Kims aren't a lot of fun. I think I'll skip over them <laughs> right now. And so we'll go to that very, very fun brood, the Qaddafis. Oh, these people were terrible. That there were seven sons, goons, thugs, enforcers, really the worst of the worst. But there was one, Saif al-Islam Qaddafi, who tried to go straight, so to speak. He really tried to be a Western-style liberal, or at least an Arab reformer. He always talked about democracy, and he really took great strides. And uh, I encountered this fellow once at an international conference, and he said, <clears throat> there's a little media coffee, and he said, you know why we Arabs lose all of our wars against Israel? Because they're a democracy and we're not democracies. And in a democracy, you rise in the military on merit. In our countries, uh, the leader wants the worst officer to be the army chief of staff because he's not much of a threat to stage a coup d'etat. That's why they win. And I thought that was rather interesting. In the end, this boy, uh, Saif al-Islam, went home when the family dictatorship was under attack in 2011, and he defended that dictatorship with arms, committed war crimes, is now wanted by the Hague. The Libyans won't turn him over. 
Uh, I do believe he is tragic, and a lot of these kids are. Uh, sometimes I couldn't tell when I was writing this book whether one of these guys was more of a victim or victimizer. Often they're both. But I would say that uh, Saif al-Islam Qaddafi is more tragic than most. Move to Syria now in the Assad family. The current guy, Bashar, was not meant to be the dictator, the successor. The old man, Hafez, anointed the first son, whose name was Basil, who was right out of central casting. He was perfect for dictatorial leadership. He was handsome. He was charismatic. He was smart. He was talented. People liked him. He had natural leadership qualities. And so he was the anointed one. Bashar was shy gawky, nerdy, bookish, wanted nothing to do with power, with politics, with the dictatorship. Anyway, I could go on, and Basel died tragically in a car accident. He was racing a sports car to the airport. It was a foggy morning. He was late. Car flipped. He died. And Bashar was called home from London, where he was practicing eye surgery. He was an ophthalmologist at the Western Eye Hospital in London. He was called home to be groomed for the dictatorship. He never wanted to be dictatorship, beg your pardon, he never wanted to be dictator, to lead that dictatorship, but he has done his utmost to keep the family business going. He has killed a great many. He's still doing it. And I'll give you just a little tidbit. It says something about the relationship between him, between Bashar and his father Hafez. The first time he entered his father's office, he was seven years old. He just had his first French lesson, and that was the language of the Syrian elite, and he was he was so excited, he burst into his father's office to tell him about it. The next time he entered that office was after his father's funeral, when he himself was dictator. Uh, about Idi Amin, I'll say just a bit. Mainly, he had 60, that is, six zero children. Uh, that's pretty hard work. And, and <laughs> he, I'll give you the span, I'll give you their ages. The first child seems to have been born in 1948. Uh, the last child in the middle 1990s. Uh, so we had them with 21 uh, mothers, and uh, by many accounts, he was a fun-loving father. They called him Big Daddy. He could be strict, but also very, very, as I say, fun-loving. He had his exile in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. He drove a big Chevy Caprice Classic station wagon, loved it. The family shopped at Safeway. And I'll give you this nugget, which may be the appropriate word for this nugget, um, although that's more McDonald's. Uh, his favorite food in all the world, this is Idi Amin, the butcher of Uganda, was Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is popular in the Arab world where he was exiled. And that really is something he and I have in common, because I love it too. Um, I interviewed at length, though by email, one of his sons, Jafar, who's really, I would say, a stand-up guy. He is, here's some modern psychological parlance, he is conflicted in that on one side, he is defensive of his father, he is whitewashing of his father, uh, he is in denial, there's another psychological term. On the other side, there is some awareness that things went badly wrong, and he works for reconciliation between Ugandans. And I must say, despite everything, I admire him. Uh, he has a deep, resonant voice, like the old man, I guess, and he does, uh, he does voiceovers, that's part of his career in Uganda. Pol Pot, the leader of the Khmer Rouge, that genocidal dictatorship, he had a daughter, as I mentioned, late in life. He was about 60, and uh, he loved her, treated her quite tenderly. He was out of power in the jungles at that time, and uh, she loved him back. She was 12 when he died. Uh, there, there's much more to tell, but one thing I want to say is that this girl went on to earn a graduate degree in English literature. And I remark on this because her father and his gang killed people who merely wore glasses on suspicion that they had read something and that might make them a danger to the regime. And here this girl, Pol Pot's lone child, earned a master's in, of all things, English literature. So, I wanted to say that <clears throat> Again, these kids have some things in common, but they are individuals, and that stayed my hand a bit in doing too much generalizing. Uh, take this question of nature-nurture, which I've been asked about. Ceausescu, the monster of Romania, had two sons, Valentin and Nicu. 
And Niku, the younger one, was a perfect little monster, a chip off the old block. He was terrible. He was a miserable human being. He spent his life strutting and raping and killing his way through Romania until he drank himself to death after his father's downfall when he was in his early 40s. Niku was, that is. A tragic life, but a life that inflicted great harm on others. So Niku was the little monster of a bigger monster. His older brother, Valentin, as far as I know, has never harmed a hair on anyone's head, has lived blamelessly. He studied physics, wanted to be nothing but a scientist, didn't want anything to do with power or dictatorship. He's worked at the same scientific institute on the outskirts of Bucharest the whole of his career, lives very quietly. Where does that leave us with nature nurture? I have no idea. As our president said in a different context, uh, that's above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> But others can have a, a crack at it. Um, one thing I did notice about these children, I think I mentioned this about someone, they tend to be in denial about their upbringing, about those circumstances, about their dad, about the dictatorship. I can't really blame them. I think otherwise they'd go crazy. And often they were crazy enough as it was. And they are. And when I was writing my book, uh, I live in New York, and I passed a sign, a poster for a Broadway show. Jersey Boys, which is about early rock and roll. I think it's the Frankie Valley story. And the tagline, or the slogan was, everybody remembers it how they need to. And I thought, you know, that's true of these men and women I'm studying. A lot of them, they're remembering it how they need to, just to keep from going completely nuts. And I do sympathize, but I don't let them off the hook entirely. And I'll tell you this story, which involves a little name dropping, so forgive me. Um, a dear friend of mine is the middle son of the great man of the Soviet Union, Solzhenitsyn, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who had three sons, and I know two of them, the middle one very, very well. And we were talking about Stalin's children. And it occurred to me that my friend Ignat is the exact counterpart of Stalin's son, uh, Vasily. Uh, Vasily was born... Uh, to the worst man in the history of the Soviet Union. Ignat was born to arguably the best man in the history of the Soviet Union. Neither one chose this, right? What could they do? That was the hand they were dealt. And I don't want to sympathize too much with Vasily because he was like a Soviet Niku Ceausescu, the little monster of a bigger monster. He was just a horrible man, died the same way, drank himself to death in his earlier, maybe mid-40s. But Vasily... First of all, he's born to Joseph Stalin. That's the initial, how do you do? Uh, second, his mother killed herself when he was, I think, 11. And he was raised by Stalin's bodyguards. These were the hardest, most vicious men in the whole Soviet secret police, the, NK the NKVD. It would have been pretty hard for Vasily to turn out non-vicious, and, and he didn't. And it's not that I'm excusing him. I don't even want to understand him all that much in the sense of, well, excusing him. But I must say he had a lot to overcome and he didn't overcome it. And a few of them did. Uh, finally, because I'll, I'll move on to other topics, I just want to give you the reaction of some of the readers to my book. And um, they've reacted in different ways, unexpected ways by me. And that's been really a nice thing. And one reaction was this. I didn't aim for this, but I got it from several readers, including Mark Helpern, the novelist, who blurbed my book. He said that reading the book made him all the more grateful to have been born into a democracy under the rule of law, uh, in, an, in an atmosphere of ordered liberty. And he just pointed out how rare that atmosphere is, that dictatorship is so common to varying degrees, and the rule of law instead of men is so uncommon, and we're lucky to have it. Or as Ben Franklin said, a republic if you can keep it. So that's my slightly... Uh, the platitudinous and hokey note that I end on this section, but uh, I'm kind of hokey, so what the heck, I like democracy and republicanism and intensely dislike dictatorship. So um, Erica thought, Erica Amorati thought I should say a little bit about uh, political correctness and oppressive leftism on campus. And that's pretty much the same as talking about the campus, just in, in general, because it's so pervasive. And by golly, if I were in college, I don't think I'd last a day. And if I had college-age children, 
I don't think I'd know what to do with them. Uh, most of these dictators send their kids abroad to study. We are the abroad for these dictators' kids, so what are we going to do with our own children? I think of that 60s song, I think it was the 60s, Teach the Children Well. Uh, when I was in college, PC or political correctness was very, very strong. And you might even say there was a whiff of violence in the air. You got the sense that if you said the wrong thing, or even worse, did the wrong thing, maybe things wouldn't turn out so well for you. But the left was very, very strong, and conservatives kept their heads down. But I'm not sure it was n as nutty as right now. There were just so few people who were right of center. There was a lot of talk about diversity, but it wasn't diversity of thought. And my line at the time was, when they, when they say diversity, what they're really talking about is, you know, a black Marxist and an Hispanic Marxist and a lesbian Marxist and an Alut Marxist, you know, that, that, that was their diversity. And I wanted a kind of pluralism, a diversity of thought. And that's pretty much, it depends on the context, but pretty much the only affirmative action or tokenism I'm in favor of. I think there ought to be a sprinkling of conservatives on campus and sprinkling of, of a sprinklings of other types. Um, the language today on campus, I'm not sure I fully understand. I jotted down some words, you know, safe rooms, microaggressions. Uh, I guess I'm a walking macroaggression as a senior editor of National Review. Trigger warnings, you know, no one ever gave me one of those. And this is almost impossible to parody or satirize. Also, um, w when these kids, some of them, these lefty kids, when you say something they disagree with, they say you're committing violence. And I'm just talking about political disagreements, or you're invalidating them, or marginalizing them, or erasing them. And the word Orwellian is greatly overused, but there is a certain Orwellianism on campus today. Another thing that bothers me is that so many of these kids, to hear them talk, they think they're so oppressed. They think they're victims. God, they're the luckiest kids on earth. They're so pampered. We live in this beautiful, wonderful country under the Constitution. They're getting this college education, and they sort of want to be victims. I mean, we all know real victims. I've studied in my career a lot of people from what the late Bob Conquest called non-consensual societies, totalitarian societies. You know, I know from victimhood, these kids aren't victims. They've won the lottery, for heaven's sakes, being on campus campuses such as Brown's. So this attitude of ingratitude, I, I'm sure that you, 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 I'm sure this room agrees with me, is really, really rankling. As is the fact that on campus there seems to be absolute sexual license. It's kind of a lord of the flies, but there's a philosophical straitjacket, right? There's no license there to express your views. And this doesn't happen merely at places where you might expect it. Oberlin, uh, Antioch, if Antioch still exists. I'm not sure it does. It might have folded. Bennington, Reed College. I know there are at least two graduates of Amherst College in this room. I know there are at least two. You'd expect it there. But the University of Missouri, Mizzou, and these activist students are actually getting faculty or administrators fired, and the administrators and the faculty are actually scared of the kids. This happened at Yale, too. When I heard this administrator make this abject apology to the students, an apology that had fear in it, I thought, oh my goodness, you can stretch these things too far, but it's a little like the Cultural Revolution in China, where the adults are afraid of the kids. What kind of state is that? The inmates are running the asylum. So I'm in favor of a return to common sense and adult control. I'm not sure what you do to get this. I think the public, especially the tuition payers, will have to demand it and not be such patsies for these people. A lot of my friends on the right, my conservative brethren, find hope in online education. And I think that's a wonderful new field. And I'm part of a, a foundation that's trying to further online education. But I do like the old idea of you know, a quad and football games and dances and all that stuff, and I like kind of a normal college. I don't know whether that's possible now. I also have a view that is not very popular with some of my young conservative friends, interns at National Review and so on. It might be slightly offensive, but they understand. I don't really think there should be much politics 
on campus, much political involvement, as much as we all love engagement and so on. It's too soon for political activism and partisanship. I say learn stuff, accumulate as much knowledge as you can, hear from all sides, build a, a, a base of, of truth, if you will, or, or facts, truth as far as you can apprehend it, and later on you will have a foundation for opinions, politics, activism, and so on. I think that, that education should be relatively, I don't mean to be a, 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 a Dewey idealist here, I didn't mean John Dewey or Tom Dewey, Dewey-eyed idealist, but I, I think education should be relatively apolitical. And that's something coming from me who's a real political junkie. Speaking of political junkiehood, let's talk grubby politics. And I know I'm among friends, so uh, let's talk a little 2016. This is my third and last topic before we have questions. And I thought we'd talk uh, first about our friends, the Democrats. I don't know if you know any or work with any here in California, or is it, but, but <clears throat> there is a Democratic Party, and sometimes they win office, and um, they have so few presidential candidates this year. It's amazing. The Republicans at the beginning had 17. And, and I think the Democrats had three or four. Why? Uh, I think they want more of a coronation than a nomination. The old line, which I've heard a million times, is the difference between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to presidential season. Republicans want to fall in line, in other words, nominate the next guy, and Democrats want to fall in love. Well, it seems to me that the Democrats are falling in line with Ms. Hillary, and the Republicans sort of want to f fall in love. And why there aren't more Democratic candidates, such as Elizabeth Warren, uh, I quote my friend Tucker Carlson, who said, I don't know what the Clintons did to keep Elizabeth Warren out of the race, but I'm impressed. And, and, and I am too, so I guess she'll get it. Uh, I sort of like that Bernie Sanders is an open socialist. I like my socialists open and self-declared and not kind of sneaky. And I'm not sure there's any real difference between uh, Bernie and Hillary, but I, I kind of like Sanders's candor. Uh, would that everyone on that side were as candid. And about Hillary, seems like I've been talking about this woman forever, since about 1991. And I want to quote with you a friend, quote to you a friend of mine, a political journalist in Washington. It's sort of important for the story to know that he's not a right winger like me. He's more center right and quite a sensible guy. And when Hillary announced for the Senate, in New York in early 2000. This is a state she'd barely been to. But when she announced for Senate, my friend said, we will never be rid of them. They'll be in our faces for the rest of our lives. And I thought, well, you know, that's a little strong. But, you know, goodness gracious, it may well be true. And I, you know, this old, I hear these old names from the ancient past, like Sid Blumenthal and Cheryl Mills, and I can't do another four years of this or eight years, but that's, that is in prospect unless we stop her. I often ask my conservative brethren, I've done this on my podcasts, uh, do you think there's a real difference between Obama and Hillary? And they say, oh yes, of course. Obama is a real committed ideologue, a leftist. He has principles, not our principles, but principles. Hillary is kind of for sale. She's cynical, she's corrupt, she wants power, she's flexible, you can deal with her. I'm not sure I buy this. I don't really think there's a dime's worth of difference between those two. Uh, I think Hillary is more ideological than we know. And I, you know, pick your poison, really. I, I don't find her preferable. So, on to the GOP. I'm biased, I'm a Republican, I'm such a partisan. Uh, my grandmother and I used to say, well, both of them, and I'm thinking one in particular, God, we're Republican. You know, we, we wanted to be sort of less partisan and more above the fray and neutral and, you know, can hear both sides. No, not, not, not really. I am such a Republican. And so I like this field. I think it's very impressive, including the dropouts. Governor Scott Walker, Governor Rick Perry, Governor Bobby Jindal. I like some of the newcomers. I like Carly Fiorina a lot. Um, I, um, I admire Ben Carson a great deal. I wish... The Carson supporters will not like to hear this, but I wish he'd run for mayor of Baltimore. God, 
they could so use him. He'd set such a good example. He could prove his governmental medal. Uh, he's just so needed in that city, which is essentially his home city. But everybody wants to be president, including me. Nobody asks, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, I'd, I'd, I'd run at the, if I were elected dog catcher, I'd be thinking about the presidency. Uh, Donald Trump is a, a phenomenon. Uh, really, he's one of the greatest television performers we've ever known. Uh, he's a natural. I, in my job as a music critic, I sometimes say of certain opera performers, they're more comfortable on stage than most of us are in our living rooms. There's no place he'd rather be than on stage. I think that's true of Donald Trump. He needs a stage. And um, if this presidential thing doesn't work out, back home in New York, we have a, may I say, a semi-communist in the mayor's office. And I think Trump would be a hoot as mayor and maybe very, very effective as well. <laughs> Jeb Bush, I admire a great deal. And let me say something about dynasties. So I've studied these dictators and their children, uh, some of whom succeed the dad as dictator. In democracies, it's entirely different. And from the beginning, we've elected Freelinghuisens and Adamses and Harrisons and Tafts and Roosevelts and Kennedys and Clintons and Bushes. And at least, sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. And at least these are free democratic choices. A guy has a right to run for office. So the dynastic question doesn't worry me all that much in a democracy. Whether it be good for the Republican Party to nominate a third Bush is another question. But I do believe these guys have a right to run, and sometimes they lose, as Jeb did in his first gubernatorial race. Marco, such a star, so smooth, talented, uh, articulate, a fierce anti-communist, an appreciator of free enterprise. There's our other Cuban-American prince, Ted Cruz, and uh, I have a bias, he's an old friend of mine, so I'm declared for him and I'm helping him. Uh, smart as a whip. <clears throat> Let me tell you something about Chris Christie. I was thinking of this after the last debate. I was talking to a political journalist friend of mine, and you might think I do that a lot, and it, it's true, and <laughs> these are different people, by the way. <laughs> and there was a period in 2012, in the, I guess, late spring, early summer, midsummer, we had nothing to talk about except who would Mitt Romney's running mate be? And so it was about a month or two months of that, you know, veep stakes, who's the VP gonna be? And I said to this very sharp political analyst, whom would you nominate if you were Mitt? And he said, Christie. And that surprised me because very few others were saying that. I said, why? He said, because Christie is a bruiser and the Obama machine is a mean, hard, killer machine. And Romney is a gentle, gentlemanly, Christianly man. And he needs a bruiser at his side. And that would be Christie. And you know, he is. The guy is a rhetorical bulldozer, for heaven's sakes. So the one question is, will we win with whatever nominee in the fall? I hope so. Everyone says that 2016 is a pivotal election, the make or break election. Guys, I kind of thought that about 2012. And when we came up short then with what I thought was a very attractive ticket in Romney and Ryan, and when the public chose Obama-Biden again, I lost heart a bit. I will regain heart, but I lost it a bit. Bit. And I was talking with a friend, I was talking with Ignat Solzhenitsyn, the self-same man, not about Stalin's children, but about the primaries and politics the other night. And I was saying that 2012 was a dagger in my heart. I've since plucked it out. But. And he said, the most painful election for me was 92. And I thought, by golly, I agree with him. Now, you might think 92, it was a completely... Uh, not a consequential election at all. Bush 41 to Clinton, ho-hum, yawn, right? The country kind of runs on autopilot. But when the American people rejected a second term of Bush, that honorable war hero, in favor of Bill Clinton, this sax-playing horn dog out of the new left, <laughs> I thought, what country am I in? And so sometimes I think we're a goner, we're in decline. But then I think, I sometimes quote, when talking about classical music, People are always dooming and glooming about classical music. I often quote the late pianist scholar Charles Rosen, who said, the death of classical music is perhaps its oldest tradition. And so, 
And so America's been on the way out for a long time, and we keep going, and there's life in the old gal yet. And I think it's probably time for me to shut up and listen to you, but thank you so very much. So don't be shy, ask questions on anything under the sun, be it dictators, politics, the campus, tiddlywinks. Uh, I don't know much about technology, uh, but they, they let me into the area anyway. Do you think there is a, a, is there is a big difference in a large state primary preferences versus small states? The, the primaries are different. Sure, well we have a diversity of states they get a little less diverse as we move around. We're such a mobile society. We hope an upwardly mobile society. Often people live other than where they're born. So lots of states are now mixtures. Uh, take Florida, for example. People from all over live in Florida. So that's a very representative American state. But big or little, uh, it's an advantage to a candidate. Sometimes a disadvantage, actually. It depends on who the candidate is. Uh, but at least in a small state, you have to talk to people. You have to meet a high percentage of the voters. If you campaign in Delaware, um, you have to talk one-on-one -on -one with all the voters all the time. Campaigning in California or Texas or New York, that's a different proposition. Uh, but um, I, I like the I like what a smaller state in a primary, which is say a less populous state in a primary or a caucus, forces the candidates to do. I think that's a good thing. Because when it comes to a state like this one, a lot has to do with media buys, uh, which is fine, but it's hard to shake those millions and millions of hands. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of interesting. I, I, I know when Joel used to have this job, it, it's, you've got all these independent people, but sometimes two questions come together that were somewhat different. Uh, one of our members asked, are there any female dictators? And then there was another question that it made me think, all monsters are dictators, but, are n but not all dictators are monsters. The thought was, well, did you ever consider Indira Gandhi's sons? She was a dictator, but not a monster. And are, are there any female dictators? Uh, or monster if dictators? If you don't count queens and kind of ceremonial figures, a dictatorship is really a man's business. You might want to say that Indira had a very brief period of emergency rule, as they call it, two years in the mid-1970s. Uh, I think it would be a stretch to call her a dictator. And so there really haven't been proper female dictators. I can tell you there are several firstborn daughters who, if they had been of the other sex, would have become dictator. I feel quite sure that Hafez Assad uh, would have uh, anointed his eldest daughter, Bushra, and uh, Papa Doc would have named his eldest daughter, Marie Denise, for sure. And I also think um, Kim Jong-il, the middle Kim, would have named a daughter who was a real sharp one, often at his side. Uh, but they were of the wrong sex, or as we'd say today, gender. And so the boys took over. But uh, thus far, as I say, you know, queens in certain periods, including uh, way back, they're a different story. But really, dictatorship is a man's business. Okay, and but sort of excuse a... Excuse me. Th there have been some wives who have been virtual co-dictators. Uh, Mrs. Ceausescu, Mrs. Hoja, the fourth wife of Mao, whom we know as Madame Mao. Uh, these were ruthless, ruthless people. And Mrs. Hoja is still alive in her mid-90s. She's known by the people as the crow. And sort of along those lines is, was there ever any mother's influence on these children of dictators? Yes. Often the mothers were a soft influence, as they should have been. Sometimes they were rather harder. Usually the mothers were more normal than the fathers. And, uh, but the dad obviously ruled the roost. And um, I'll tell you about the Stalin family. Uh, Mrs. Stalin thought that her husband, Joseph Stalin, was too soft and rather coddled the children. And I say in my book, please try to imagine a household in the Kremlin in which Stalin is the more caring parent. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Stalin was a really hard Bolshevik woman. I feel a bit sorry for her. She did kill herself. 
It couldn't have been easy to be married to Joseph Stalin, but she did choose it, I must say. And sort of staying on that theme in, in the family, would you ever consider a book doing parents of dictators? So how did these, at one time these were children, how did they end up that way? Yes. Well, some of them had a very difficult time. Some of them had a more normal time. And I'm not excusing anyone, I promise you. This is not Phil Donahue or Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and Saddam Hussein was one of the worst, most monstrous men who ever lived, certainly who ever became the leader of a nation. Uh, he was just about the cruelest of the cruel. But let me tell you about his beginning. I think he never knew his biological father. He ran off. His stepfather uh, abused him. Uh, he ran away when he was, I think, five or seven to the care of his maternal uncle, who was his foster father, who was a great admirer of Hitler, and who wrote a book called Three Whom God Should Not Have Created, Persians, Flies, and Jews. Now, I'm not letting Saddam Hussein off the hook, but that was one heck of a beginning. And yes, it would make another book, probably. Not for me, for someone else. I've had my fill. <clears throat> right. Okay. A sort of an interesting question here. What effect did Israeli rescue uh, at Entebbe have on Idi Amin? It embarrassed him. Uh, <clears throat> he did something unspeakable to a woman, a passenger who needed medical care. I won't get into it, but you can imagine. It's in my book. It embarrassed him. It was a great, great day. It was one of the great events of that period. And it took place on our bicentennial day, mm -hmm. July 4th, mm -hmm. 1976. That was great. Um, this is interesting. Uh, are you aware or have people made this known? People who are in your book, have they read and commented on it? Have you gotten feedback from any of these monsters? <coughs> monsterlets. Yeah, monsterlets, right. Yeah, Second um, generation monsters. Or. I, I know they have. And uh, they've not commented, commented, certainly directly, to me. But of course, one is interested in oneself. Even I occasionally, God forbid, read about myself. And I'm always sorry I do. <laughs> and um, word to the wise, I don't know if it ever comes up, don't Google yourself ever. <laughs> that, was, that, was a, you know. that sounds like good advice. Well, back to politics. One of the questioners is, the youth's enthusiasm for Bernie demonstrates a glaring ignorance of the danger of centralized power. The question is specifically, I don't know if it's related, but I'm sure you can speak to that. What are you doing to get your book into the hands of the younger people? I'm not sure this book necessarily talks to centralized government, although dictators would certainly sure. support that. But sure. do you get to discuss that? Well, I quote our friend Phil Graham who says that economic illiteracy is the Democratic Party's best friend. And the state of economic, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The state of economic education is woeful. I would like to place into the hands of everyone the works of Thomas Sowell. Oh. If I could give them his book, yeah. Basic Economics. But <clears throat> socialism is seductive. Social, here I'm quoting Jean Kirkpatrick. Socialism has calm, soothing words. Fairness, equality, solidarity, community, compassion, social justice. A free economy, capitalism, is not for everyone. It can be very, very daunting. And there are words like self-reliance, dynamism, choice. All those things you know, they don't necessarily sell. Capitalism is not for everyone, although it benefits society at large. So the socialist idea or the collectivist idea, you can't really kill it off. This idea of social justice is so powerful. And here I'm not gonna quote your friend and my friend Dinesh D'Souza. We offer freedom. The other side says fairness. And this desire, this impulse, this longing for or insistence on fairness is very deep. Those of you that had children, what do they say when they're small? That's not, not fair. fair. That's not fair. And I think Dinesh is onto something. When we say freedom and they say fairness, they're likely to win. 
It's just something we all have to get around, and I think we have to work harder to persuade people. I'll go back to Graham, Phil Graham and this issue of free trade. Bill Buckley once talked about trade with Graham on his television program, Firing Line. And Graham had been an econ professor, great supporter of free trade. And as a politician, Graham never brought it up on the stump, ever. And Buckley said, why? And Graham said, because free trade benefits almost everyone, and they don't know it. It harms a few, and they all know it. So there's no percentage in bringing it up. That is a painful truth. That was a little depressing. <laughs> One of the questions says, Trump That's says... That's what I'm here for, Erica. That's I, why you asked. I know, I know. Trump says, I can get along with Democratic leadership. He says Reagan negotiated with Tip O'Neill. Actually, Reagan did no such thing. And I've heard actually both sides. Maybe you can settle this, Jay. Uh, he actually convinced the Blue Dog Democrat. Can Cruz correct Trump? So imagine we've heard... Mr. Trump say, I can work with anybody. He cites Reagan and O'Neill. Did that happen? I know it's certainly in the mythos. It happened to a degree. It's overblown by people like Chris Matthews, who used to work for O'Neill. He was chief speechwriter. I'd like to tell you a story. I was talking with Newt Gingrich when Boehner was speaker. Newt, I said, how do you think Boehner's doing? And I thought Newt would say, Oh, just terrible, terrible. No one can be speaker but me. Newt said, he's doing the least bad job possible. He said, I got to deal with Clinton. Dealing with Obama, you just can't. You can't. There's no dealing with him. He just won't. It's a left-wing brick wall. And I thought, you know, Newt knows what he's talking about. He held the position. Very few have. And that made me think, well, it made me feel better about Boehner. Obama is a bare-knuckled ideologue, and you see the way he, he rammed Obamacare through by the skin of his teeth. And he got it. Now it's up to us to try to do something about it, if the voters will let us. It's up to them. I often annoy my fellow conservatives by saying, it is a democracy, the people speak, and they wanted Obama twice. The first time, I can sort of give them a pass. The second time, I'm less forgiving but I'm not running for office, so I can blast the people. Do you have any suggestions for voter fraud? We hear that every election cycle. First, is it... Win by enough so they don't cheat. They can, can't cheat you out of it. Win yeah. by enough. Yeah. It's like playing with a golfer who cheats. You know, if you beat him bad enough, he really can't get ahead of you. But I, I, I've asked people, because I don't want to be a total partisan. I mentioned those conversations I had with my grandmother. And I said to Karl Rove once on a stage, this is nothing secret, I said, I hear all the time that the Democrats, well, they, 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 they are, let me just put this delicately, they are irregular. <laughs> I, I hear that all the time. I said, but don't we do it? I hate to think that, you know, one side is squeaky clean, you know, goes by the book, follows the rules, and the other side is, I just hate to, how could it be that way? Because you know, people are people, and... You know, there are good people on each side and not so good people on each side. And Rove said, we really don't. We really don't. And so uh, I am for as transparent a system as we can possibly have. And just to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. Because as, as we said before, I think one thing American, Americans in general really like is a, a sense of fairness. And that includes fair play in elections. And that 2000 experience in the Florida recount, I think it went the right way on the merits, but boy, was that a bitter thing. And I've sometimes wondered if I were a partisan Democrat, what would I think? I'd probably be one unhappy camper. I'm even unhappy when I win, so what the heck? <laughs> the right has made great strides in the media over the certain last five, 10 years. What, are the, what do the Republicans plan to do to try to have that kind of an impact with education, starting with elementary on up? In the Reagan administration, there was an expression, personnel is policy. Uh, what you'll see in policy depends on who is there doing the policy making, whom the government is staffed with. And the teacher, the individual teacher, makes a great deal of difference. I think as you influence the culture generally, you influence education. We have to try to convince people to want the good stuff in a curriculum, the basics, 
you know, I would return to the McGuffey readers if I had my way, but you know, they ought to know something about the Declaration and the Constitution and, and the good and bad of our history, America warts and all, and not all bad, you know? And, and I, I like to think that the country is so big and diverse, you can find things that are a little out of the mainstream. You know, I certainly, I don't think I had a right of center teacher ever, but I found stuff. I found National Review and the American Spectator and commentary, and I read books and I was curious. And you can, you can find things. And uh, I hope we're not so ghettoized, each one in his own media environment, that there's not some crossing. You know what I mean by that? I always figured that uh, I should read some people on the left. It's like putting fiber in my diet, but mainly I want, I want hot fudge sundaes, so I just stick to my right-wing favorites. Yeah, so I understand. And along the lines of education, here's a softball. What's your opinion of Hillsdale College? It's <clears throat> our Harvard. Oh, wow. Well put. Great. Now we're going back to some monsters questions. Are there any historical examples of a dictatorial Muslim country changing over time to a democracy? And if not, why do you think not? All of them have democratized to one degree or another and then fallen back. So this comes and fits and starts. And by the way, the same is true of Latin America. Uh, we thought in the Reagan years that we had really defeated the fascists the uh, Caudillos, uh, the Juntas, the extremists of left and right, people like the FMLN on the left in El Salvador and Arena on the right. Remember we had that marvelous president, Jose Napoleon Duarte, who was a graduate of Notre Dame and kissed the American flag on the White House lawn. He was a Christian Democrat. That has gone the other way. So uh, the Arab world is a very tough nut to crack. But there are liberals there in the good older sense. There are people who want human rights and a kind of democracy and decency. I just wrote about a political prisoner this week in Saudi Arabia, Raif Badawi, who is a very brave man who simply advocated basic human rights in this country. There are women who think they really ought to be allowed to drive. And uh, so I think it will just happen, but not soon enough for us, not soon enough. Until then and even after eternal vigilance, if you're the United States and under attack, which we are by this worldwide jihad. Thank you. And a, a couple more dealing with the book and monsters. Is it possible to some degree that there was uh, the Kremlin sanctioned Svetlana's defection? Uh, no. It's an interesting question, but uh, no. And she did, when she was very unhappy here in the West, she went back to the Soviet Union. She redefected, so to speak, in 1984 and immediately regretted it. She would have been stuck there for the rest of her life. Luckily for her, Gorbachev rose to power in 1985, and she got out after a year and a half. And she flew back to O'Hare Airport in Chicago and said, gee, I had to leave in order to realize how wonderful it was here. And then she drove up to Spring Green, Wisconsin, where she lived, and she eventually died nearby in a town in Wisconsin called Richmond Center. Uh, but no, um, the Soviet government was shocked and appalled uh, when she left and made a lot of noise about it. And for the last one, this is interesting, are you aware of the, these children of dictators, did they ever meet each other, either through their parents or over time, or you had a reunion, or whatever that's? Uh... <clears throat> <clears throat> they could really compare notes. They, they, they really could, they would have a lot to talk about. Uh, but let me end with this. I, I thought of it when, when you asked about uh, Arab dictatorships and democracy. This is not Arab, but it's Persian. Khomeini had five children, and there are about 15, 20 grandchildren, something like that. One of those grandchildren is a boy, <laughs> former boy, he's a middle-aged man now, but a fellow named Hussein who's a real liberal Democrat with a small d, like us, a real believer in freedom and democracy. And when our forces toppled Saddam in Iraq, he moved to Iraq, went into exile, and he called on a coalition led by the United States to do the same thing in his home country, Iran. He called for the overthrow, even by force of American arms, of the very dictatorship that his grandfather had established. And he came here to the United States. Your last question has reminded me of, of this. 
uh, for a while. He gave a talk at the American Enterprise Institute, and he met, he had a tete-a-tete -tete with the son of the Shah. And I would have loved to be a Persian-speaking fly on the wall of that one, the grandson of Khomeini and the son of the Shah. In early 19, beg your pardon, in early 2004, in the first week of January, he got an urgent message from his grandmother, Khomeini's widow, saying, uh, come home immediately. Uh, there had been threats against the family, by which I mean physical threats, murder. You must come home because of what you're doing. And he went home immediately, and I believe, and this is 2004, has been under house arrest ever since. So here was a kid, a grandson, not a son, but a fellow who tried to break out. And I should mention that in addition to Svetlana, there is a defector, one of Castro's daughters, uh, Alina Fernandez, defected to the United States in the 1990s with the aid of a false passport and a wig. And uh, she later became an anti-Castro talk show host in Miami, which I love. Yeah, that is great. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Jay Nordlinger. Thanks a million.